I always say I was never the kid that sold lemonade or traded up pencils. Um, I was a first-gen college student, and my parents would say Steve Jobs was a bum because he couldn't get a job. There's a conversation to be had around, and you just said it there, you know, concentration versus diversification. Mm -hmm. And I think the startup ecosystem and the way that startups work <laughs> constitutes like concentration, yes. not spreading out yeah. resources. Well, I think this is where kind of we can't always rely on government to solve all of our problems. That almost seems like it should drive a distinction between the two because you have entrepreneurship and then you have innovation. Right. And it's like innovators are entrepreneurs, but not all entrepreneurs are necessarily innovators. Welcome back to the Middle Tech Podcast. You've got Logan Jones and Evan Knowles here today recording out of our friend JP Blevins space. Uh, very grateful he lets us use this space like this. Always fun bringing guests in here. Uh, we sat down with Larry Horn, who is the CEO of Amplify, uh, which is another Kentucky innovation hub up in Louisville. Um, so if you've heard our interviews with Dave Knox of Blue North, Brian Rainey of Awesome Inc., Colby Hall of SOAR, uh, all of those organizations are Kentucky innovation hubs, which the state supports to help support entrepreneurship and innovation in our state. Um, so we got to hear a little bit about what makes Amplify different, um, some of Larry's background, and really just some candid conversation around entrepreneurship, innovation, the difference between the two, uh, and what's unique to Louisville and the different challenges that they're facing. So Evan, I know you spent a lot of time up in Louisville, both with Simba and now with Devise as well. Um, what were some of your takeaways from this conversation? Yeah, I think it's interesting to hear the history of how the hub has evolved and the different organizations that have had their hands on the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem there and things that have gone wrong and things that have gone right and how they're learning and can just continuing to push forward. Uh, my favorite part of the conversation was, I think, just kind of pushing the envelope a little bit and kind of prying at, you know, why as a state do we spread the funds out and not, you know, be very concentrated with it. I like that part of the conversation. So, you know, for those listening, that's one that I think a lot of people, if you really understand how the startup ecosystem works and just startups in general, you would say, let's concentrate funds. But Larry tells us, you know, hey, you know, this is a state funded organization. So here are reasons that we don't concentrate so much. So I thought yeah. that was an interesting dynamic and, and good thing to pull on that's important that came out of this conversation. Yeah, it's a nuanced topic and uh, always enjoy getting to sit face to face with somebody and kind of dive into stuff like that. So uh, we hope you guys enjoy the conversation. Before we dive in, just a quick reminder, um, you know, please subscribe uh, to our podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts to make sure you can stay up to date with the episodes we're putting out. Uh, you can follow us at Middle Tech Pod on all socials. We appreciate any support uh, in the form of following us or subscribing. Uh, and before we dive into this interview, we want to get a quick word from the sponsors that make all of this possible. Before highlighting our sponsors, we'd just like to state that the views and content shared on this platform do not necessarily reflect those of our show sponsors. Middle Tech is presented by KY Innovation, the Kentucky Cabinet for Economic Development's Office of Entrepreneurship. KY Innovation exists to support and develop Kentucky's startup ecosystem, and we are proud to be supported by an organization whose mission aligns so closely with ours. If you're a founder building in Kentucky, you need to check out the resources that KY Innovation has to offer. You can find more information by clicking the link in our show notes or going to kyinnovation.com. Middle Tech is sponsored by Bolt Marketing. Take your website to the next level with a website that's built to work. At Bolt Marketing, they're revolutionizing websites for small businesses that are affordable, customizable, and hassle-free. Whether you have a construction company, a boutique clothing store, or you own a hot yoga studio, they have options for you. Click the link in our show notes to explore their marketing options that can transform your marketing and grow your business. And as a personal note, Bolt Marketing built our website and they were awesome to work with throughout the entire process. We highly recommend working with. Middle Tech is also supported by Huntsicker, an impact venture studio based in Lexington, Kentucky. Huntsicker is creating companies out of the ordinary by founding and funding the next generation of purpose-driven startups. They partner with founders to create indispensable solutions to the world's most fundamental problems. On a quarterly basis, they host an invite-only intimate gathering called Fireside Combos, where attendees representing a wide network of stakeholders in the regional entrepreneurial ecosystem discuss timely topics, including the role of AI for startups out of Kentucky and the challenges of identifying and attracting talent. To be considered as a guest, visit huntsicker.co slash fireside to apply. All right, Larry, welcome on to the podcast. Thank you for making the drive down from Louisville to talk to us. We are pumped to have you on. First yeah. time on the podcast. First time. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so as we said in the intro, Larry is the CEO of Amplify. Um, so just to help anybody who's listening that's not familiar with Amplify, 
Uh, you guys are a Kentucky Innovation uh, Hub organization. Um, so think of you know, organizations like Blue North. Uh, we talked to Dave Knox recently. Awesome Inc. We did that that live podcast with mm -hmm. Brian Rainey recently. So you guys are an equivalent organization to that in terms of the the services you provide to the startup ecosystem. Correct. As you think about the way that state wants to deploy those dollars for us, um, we do other work, but that's the work we do for the state. Cool. Yeah, and I, I definitely want to dive into sure. some of that other work later on uh, in the podcast. But let's just start kind of at the the higher level yeah. with Amplify. When somebody asks you, "What is Amplify?" <laughs> right. What do you tell them? Um, you know, really, I get the spill is we're one of the six hubs that is backed by Kentucky Innovation. But a lot of times I talk about it's it's the dream that there is an organization that's filled with founders that run it, that care about founders, that want to see the community get better. Mm -hmm. um, I often talk about the reason I'm a part of or helped start Amplify was I really just want to build an organization that existed when I started my first startup. And one that helps be a cog in the wheel of our community that my kids want to move back to. Mm. And so when I think about Amplify, it's like, what role can we play in our ecosystem that helps lift not not only founders, but other organizations up? You alluded to it there. Um, your background is you're a, you're a founder. Mm -hmm. So talk about, you know, that experience and how it led up to, to Amplify and sure. that background. Yeah, I know. Um, I got the weird start. I, I always say I was never the kid that sold lemonade or traded up pencils. Um, I was a first gen college student and my parents would say Steve Jobs was a bum because he <laughs> couldn't get a job. Right. Um, so entrepreneurship was never an idea of idea that was passed to me. Um, I worked for a small manufacturing company in 2006, 2007. They raised this weird thing I never heard of called a series A round. And being a first gen college student, I always knew I had to go back to school if I wanted to grow with this business. Because my, you know, my mother used to drive me to the Humana building and say, this is where you need to work. Hmm. Not realizing that David Jones Sr. is one of the greatest entrepreneurs our state has or has had. Um, so part of that, I joined UofL and went into their MBA program and chose entrepreneurship because I worked for entrepreneurs. And during that, they teach you a systematic approach of how to start businesses. And my classmates, right? There's five of us. We started a company around a technology that was vaccine for cattle. Hmm. And it fought a pest called the horn fly, which I had a lot of fun with for obvious <laughs> reasons. I used to say my <laughs> wife also thinks I'm a pest. Um, and at the time, there was a business plan competition circuit across the country and had global participants. And through this program, we ended up winning a lot of those competitions. We won close to a million dollars. Wow. And it was never an idea of mine to, to leave, you know, UofL and go start a business. I was always just going to go back and help run this company. But I think through the process, I learned a lot about what are the traits and characteristics of an, of an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And that I had them. I just was Steve Wozniak, not Steve Jobs. Right. Um, and so kind of to Evan, your point, that started the journey, but it started in a way where because it came out of University of Louisville, it wasn't the same journey that a lot of first time founders had. I was exposed to a lot of doors being open that weren't naturally open for most founders because of the success at UofL. Um, so from there, yeah, I started several other venture-backed companies. Some of you all have probably heard of Liberate Medical with Angus McLachlan. Started that with him um, and then started another one with Dave Duran called Roth River, which is IoT devices on barrels of bourbon. Um, and through that whole journey, really, my role has always been happy puppy. And then how do I make sure that community coordinates with us? How do we go talk to our friends that are attorneys and accountants and investors? And I think all that led to what now ends up being a nice little superpower of mine in the startup community is I have a lot of relationships with the business community. I've raised all kinds of different money in different ways. I've lost a lot. And so it, it allows me that opportunity to really speak to a founder that's sitting across from me and have that same lived experience that they're probably going through. And I think that's super important to be in the position that you're in as, as CEO of, of Amplify because you need to be able to relate to mm -hmm. the people that you're serving and being able to have had that experience, yeah. I'm sure, plays into your day-to-day -day role. Um, talk about kind of the early early innings of developing this type of organization in mm -hmm. Louisville. So I know there is, there's Leap First. Right. So I think it'd be just helpful context to talk through uh, how that was formed and sure. what where that ended up and then how Amplify kind of came yeah, out. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I think you probably some of your other guests with uh, with Dave and Brian, you know, that, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, whatever it was, legislation was created for a long time. It was Enterprise Core, which is inside of the chamber for Louisville. And that was probably until 2018. 
And as we always say, we're always kind of at the whim of who's in the governor's mansion when you're right. when you're funded by the state primarily. And Enterprise Corps at that time, when there was a new RFP with Governor Bevin's organization, um, the group that got that that won that RFP was a collection of companies from the outside. Seemed very healthcare focused. It was University of Louisville's Research Innovation. It was the Louisville Healthcare CEO Council, and then a small accelerator called Accelerate Health. Yep. And those three organizations um, collectively were awarded the grant, um, and they were called LEAP, and that was the Louisville Entrepreneurial Acceleration Partnership, not Branders in this. Um, and then they created a net new entity that was unfortunately also called LEAP. So the, or, the organization that was built to serve entrepreneurs had the same acronym as the larger group. So there was this idea that healthcare was its only focus. Mm. From the outside looking in, you would kind of understand that. Now, also kind of in a, you know, ways not to do things, when that got launched at the same time, the state provided a consulting agreement with Techstars to do ecosystem development. And then there was also this wonderful woman, uh, Wendy Lee, who came in to be a consultant for the Louisville Healthcare CEO Council to help them understand how to corporates and startups can collaborate. Sounds great on paper, but it was a really confusing moment in the Louisville ecosystem. So at the same time, Enterprise Core rolls up underneath of Leap. And then, do you all remember 1804? I don't think so. It was a great bi-state uh, collaboration between Indiana and Kentucky that was, you know, kind of the, the complement to Enterprise Core of like run by founders, um, focused on founders, and just was kind of the gritty version of that. Um, those were both supposed to roll up underneath of Leap. As politics happened, that was not the case. So there was an unceremonious end to the 18, 19 year run of what was Enterprise Corps, and 1804 also closed. So for Leap, if you think about that, kind of got launched in January of 19. Uh, Patrick Henshaw was brought in to run that organization. Um, I think they officially got their start in June. The EIN is, it starts in June. Um, and then by the end of that year, you know, there was enough things happening inside that dynamic where Patrick and the organization decided to part ways. And in December of 19 is when I was brought on to be the executive director. Mm -hmm. Got it. So what, what would you say, you know, looking back through that experience, um, what are some of the biggest takeaways that the state should move forward sure. with and learnings? Yeah, and I think it's something I've also learned from my friends up in Cincinnati is that sometimes when large corporations are involved, even if their intention is well-meaning, that they carry the biggest stick mm. because they have the most money, they have the most influence, and a lot of times they end up wanting to guide what the entrepreneurial organization wants to do. And I mean, I think as, you know, leaning, when Techstars, the ecosystem development group was in Louisville, I actually spent three months as their boots on the ground in Louisville. So really dove into the Boulder thesis um, and a lot of the work that Techstars was focused on. And a lot of that is, is corporations are important, universities are important, but the most important thing is the founder. Sure. And how do we keep them in the middle of our thoughts and our actions? And I don't think that's innate to most corporations. So I think that's really, I don't know if the state got that out of it, but I know we sure did. And so when I brought up Centerfuse and my friends in Cincinnati is some of their feedback as I went and started looking at other communities, what are you guys doing well? You know, the, the feedback is like, man, we'd love to be in your spot. We probably went too much corporate too early. Mm. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of blessings that came out of that for them. But I think, you know, fast forward 10 plus years, I think they would have liked to had more entrepreneurial led activities um, than the other. So when you say engaging with corporates, I, I want to linger on that for sure, a second please. because that is something that we've talked about um, with different founders <laughs> on this podcast is, how much it can transform a business if you if you land a big corporate client. So I think when you think of corporates engaging with the startup ecosystem, your ideal scenario is their yeah. clients. They're they're piloting, they're giving introductions, yeah. all that those sorts of things. How similar was it to the ideal versus like where did it drift off to when when engaging with corporates? Yeah, I think that um, speaking of the I mean the leap the leap group specifically. You know, if you think about that collection of these aging healthcare companies, I mean, you know, Humana was a part of that. Um, and my joke for founders is like, stop trying to make Humana your first customer, <laughs> right? And so they were looking for, you know, for their part, rightfully so, what are solutions and innovations that can help move the needle for their organizations? And being such a nascent entrepreneurial community like Louisville is, there wasn't a lot of companies that could serve those really large organizations. Yeah. 
So we kind of take a different approach, you know, as Amplify, we take a different approach to really how we think about the corporate community, trying to partner with GLI a lot on this, which is there's kind of four ways that corporations can help the startup community. You know, so things that we know exist, we just don't talk about it is, you know, mentorship and subject matter expertise, uh, product feedback, uh, pilot trials, whether free or paid, and then of course being a customer. Um, and I think what has happened is that a lot of these corporations have been trained that when they get in front of a bunch of founders, they're all going to throw their products in their face and say, buy me, buy me. And what we're trying to accomplish is like, look, there's a lot of opportunities for you to support a startup without being a customer now, but hopefully that's a pathway to become a customer. Or, you know, for example, as I say, for a lot of our service providers in the city is like, hey, you have all these amazing clients that exist. Why don't you be the connector to them? Um, and I think that's a, you know, a lot of the work that we do in this is the 20 year, you know, culture change play, um, that goes to how do we look at the startup community as a partner and not some, something as a feeder, if you will, into the rest of the community. Yeah. I, I, one, one thing I wanted to throw in there real quick, yeah. you, you made, it made me laugh when you said, don't go after Humana as your first client, yeah. <laughs> because the startup that I was with for four years previously had Humana come inbound to us, like in this miraculous, yeah. weird fashion. Yeah. That it was because COVID hit and they were transforming more of their sales cycle to be uh, digital based yeah. rather than than in person. And anyway, I, I laugh about it because one, it totally transformed our company like overnight. They yeah. basically come and dropped millions of dollars on our yeah. heads and we're like, oh shit, like time to figure <laughs> it out. Um, but the amount that we learned and like the amount of the, how quickly the company matured yeah. by having that partnership was I mean, it made all the difference. Sure. It kept us from having to raise venture capital and give up equity. It taught us how to work with executives of yeah. high-level companies like that. We got several introductions through that relationship. Yeah. I mean, it was quite literally transformed the company. Um, Evan, I wanted to turn it to you. You might have been about to go into this. Now that you're building Devise, I see you doing a lot of pilots and learning from corporates. And I, I just felt like you would have some feedback from your experience doing that now that you're you know, building a startup on your own. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think we're building very much a enterprise product, at least as part of the goal to go into that market. And so if you're going after enterprise, you know, B2B software, you know, typically the corporations are where you want as much early feedback as possible. So we went through, and I'm curious to hear the relationship between, you know, GLI and, mm -hmm. and you all, but, um, you know, shout out to Jordan, Jordan Clemens over <laughs> at uh, right. GLI right. gave us a lot the of awesome- connector. Yeah, uh, Ulta, yeah, he is a great connector. It gave us all kinds of great introductions to several large corporations in Louisville that turned into pilots. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, how should a founder think about um, working with a chamber mm -hmm. um, and then coming to an entrepreneurial hub? Right. Because um, I've done both, obviously. I've worked with Awesome Inc. Um, Render Capital is, right. is one that's close with you all. I've worked close with Render. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've obviously done much, uh, a lot of work with Chambers. Um, yeah. I was just up in Northern Kentucky with uh, Covington's and Northern Kentucky's Chamber and same in Lexington and, and Louisville. So how do you think about the relationship between, you know, Chambers and what you all do? Sure. They should be synergistic, yeah. right? If you think about economic development, you know, most Chambers are driven by their investors, which are usually large corporations. And so... I know based on that structure, a lot of the work they're going to do is going to be the work that is going to help those larger corporations, you know, whether it's policy, advocacy, whatever that looks like. It doesn't mean they don't care about startups. They do. Um, GLI has been a great partner for us. I think we have kind of made this uh, agreement, you know, kind of informally of that early stage companies, we can work with them and then get them to GLI. And then with the idea of a Jordan Clemens, introducing them to people that are investors in their network. Um, and in reverse, how do we help those early stage companies become members of GLI? Because then as they graduate, right, I mean, our whole goal with these things is get a company to success or failure. So, but we always need to be thinking three steps ahead, not for them, but, you know, being, helping them be aware of those steps. And so a lot of that is just getting connected to those folks. And if they want to be a member of the chamber, they got to find the right value. It depends on who their customer is nine times out of 10. Usually they're not going to join for the business breakfast or to advertise, they want to just rub elbows with people that could be potential investors or customers, yeah. right? So that's how we've worked with GLI, which has worked out really well. I mean, a part of their Louisville Now campaign or um, their strategy is to make connections for startups, and they lean heavily on us to help them identify those founders and get them to them. I love that. I think that's the way it should be. And as you said, it should be synergistic. Um, 
I want to talk a little bit about the the state's involvement mm-hmm. in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So you guys are a hub a hub organization within the hub yeah. network. Um, talk a little bit about how the state interfaces with the startup ecosystem. Mm-hmm. So you know they're doing it through this hub network. Mm-hmm. We can kind of talk about that dynamic as we've covered in a few other episodes. But where do you see that it's most effective, mm-hmm. and where would you like to see things you know be improved? Sure, I think that you know bless that. All the hubs are primarily, most of us are primarily funded by the state. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, and one thing a lot of people don't realize, there are a lot of, you know, specifically Kentucky Innovation, the Cabinet of Economic Development, there are a lot of other incentives that our clients can use outside of just our personal services. Exactly. And so, you know, like one of the things I've been talking about recently is, you know, the state has this up to 50% collateral loan program. Um, if you have to put a down payment on something and, you know, if you qualify, they'll give up to 50% of that to the bank to collateralize the loan for you to buy your equipment, do whatever that looks like. Um, they also have a matching program for federal match for federal grants. So they do, a, and then, you know, angel tax credits, things like that, all the things we know. So I say that um, we're blessed that they are able to do that, especially for a state as we're surrounded by other states that just, quite frankly, have more money due to the size of a lot of the businesses that occupy that state. Um, I think the place where they I've seen continuous improvement. Now, remember for me personally, I've only been doing this for a little over four years now. And so it's been the same structure almost that entire time. I think the one improvement we can all make is just all of us understanding that the states, the thing the state government cares about primarily is the support of the Commonwealth through jobs and taxes. And, you know, we are looking at organizations where, yeah, of course we want you to hire people if you need to. Of course, you want to hire people in our backyard if you can afford it, but maybe you need to go overseas to get your development done. So there's some just disconnect or, you know, just different principles of how we want to go about growing businesses and getting to that part. Um, but quite frankly, I always say, and I say this to my hub partners, like if I had any other uh, funder that gave me the amount of money that the state luckily gives me, I would bend over backwards for them every day. Mm-hmm. Um but I think that with that being said, I think there's a ways for them to clear more runway for us to be successful and helping us with legislators and helping us with policy um, to be able to make it easier for founders to do that work in Kentucky. Since we already had a disadvantage from a state funding standpoint. Yeah. How does the state and organizations like yours think about small businesses versus innovative startups Mm. like that seems to be a gray area that yeah you know leads to i think confusion and maybe misallocation Mm -hmm. of resources at times Mm -hmm. so how how do you all think about that and that's a that's a good question so first i'll go back and say when innovation was inside of the chamber for 18 years they very much saw this as small business there was a enterprise core did look at what they would refer to as gazelles at the time um, those organizations, but to the community outward, it was very much like small business. And so the, are the rest of the Louisville community was not really cultivated to support what I would consider the innovation community. You think about innovation multipliers are, you know, if you hire someone hundred grand plus in your organization, which most startups will do, that creates three other jobs. You don't always see that in the same place as a food truck or say a main street business. Um, But to your point, we differentiate, and this is, you know, I go around and around on this because I believe founders are founders and 95% of the issues, whether you have a pizza shop or a tech company are going to be the same in those first years. But we go back to, and I've been saying tech enabled venture backable startups. And so I use those words very specifically because of how many conversations I've been in around like, well, what about this? Um, And so the way we look at it, and I think the state has been adopting this as as well is like, if the technology is the core of the business and if the technology doesn't work, the business doesn't work, then that is an organization that Amplify is supported by the state to solve. Mm. Where like if a food truck has some tech component to it, because every company is a tech company now and that, but you know, say it's online ordering that goes down, you can still serve tacos out of that food truck. That's somebody we're, we're blessed in Louisville to have a lot of partners. So we can send them over to the SBDC, to GLI, to the, to the mayor's office to get support. Um, and that lets us stay in our lane of supporting those kind of venture backable tech enabled companies. Yeah. And it also becomes just a fundamental difference between like funding mechanisms mm-hmm. for those different companies. You know, whether it's when you're, when you're talking about a small business, it's not necessarily tech enabled. You're not, yeah. you're not thinking of a massive exit 
that it makes sense to take on, mm-hmm. you know, equity investment for because you're right. going to have the the 10, 20 X exit on down the road. There's nobody right. that's going to want to acquire that or they're not going to go public, but it's, it could still be a profitable business, which sure. is a beautiful thing. Right. But when it comes to tech enabled businesses, that's where it makes sense to put that venture capital into it right. because, you know, you're chasing those the unicorn status. But right. And, uh, two and fundamentally different things. Right. Now, when I say venture backable, I mean, let's think about venture funds, which I know you all have talked about on the podcast before. I mean, they have to return a ROI back to their LPs and in short term. Right. right. Depending on where they are on that fund. And so a lot of these folks are looking for companies they can grow really quickly and have that exit. And that is more traditional. A lot of your, te- your you know, B2B SaaS companies. Um, and if you think about from a state standpoint, I mean, they put a lot of money in small businesses in a lot of different ways. Um, specifically for the hubs, this is to get those companies that could potentially scale to be 100 employees, 300 employees pretty quickly. Right. And off of that. You know, I think the, one of the reasons I asked that is when we look at the RFP. And did I answer that right? Yeah, no, you okay, did, for sure. It. Yeah. And I agree with the way you answered it. And one of the things that when we looked at the RFP for the hubs, I noticed that, you know, the, the way that the state thinks about spreading the funds mm-hmm. is interesting. So can you get into that a bit of like, sure. how does the state think about, you know, cities versus counties mm-hmm. and spreading the money out throughout the state? Um, yeah. What does that look like? Yeah. So, you know, as so we kind of talked about before we came on is, um, part of the RFP this year was that you had to look at counties outside your traditional area that you've been in. And the way they broke down the overall hubs budget was based on population. So whatever counties you had, the populations of those counties, that was the pro rata amount of the bucket of dollars that you got. So there was some, some of the hubs that got more money. There were some of the hubs that got less money, regardless of what the territory, regardless of how large geographically the territory may have looked, it was really about population. Mm. Now, I mean, that's a unique way of approaching it. You know, I would have liked to have seen, um, we were talking before about, we have picked up E-Town as one of our, one of our cities in, in the Lincoln Trail Area Development District. And if you think about these emerging cities that have a lot of opportunity, if you base the amount of work we're supposed to do on that now on the current population versus what the population will be, I think that's a mistake in which we could have we could be doubling down more on those areas and getting in front of those curves. As I've been saying to everyone that'll listen about that, I was like, as we talked about before, if we can become an innovation partner with Blue Oval, or as all these net new humans are moving into that city, we have the resources abundantly ready to support them, whether they are a food truck or a tech business, um, which requires a lot of capital when you're starting from a place with lower amount of resources. Well, I think the, the reason I ask is, yeah. that, you know, there's a conversation to be had around, and you just said it there, you know, concentration versus diversification. Mm-hmm. And I think the startup just ecosystem and the way that startups work <laughs> constitutes like concentration, yes. not spreading out yeah. resources. But the state, of course, I get why they want to spread out resources because it's a political game. You've got to sure. make sure you're, but you, you got to have legislators. They're going to vote for it. And of course yeah, there is yeah. the legislator that is like, well, where's the support in my County? Right. Yeah. Right. It was like, well, you've got 18 people and none of them have a startup. So, but we, again, how do we support everyone in our, in the Commonwealth? I wouldn't disagree with you. You know, I've been saying for the last four years, I mean, we have Louisville and we had the surrounding counties, but we didn't have enough bandwidth just to cover the people in our backyard. Yeah. Um, and so as you expand geographically, just from time and placement, it's, it's harder versus focusing only on the areas where we can get the biggest amount of yeah. Yeah. return. Well, I think the arc of that conversation was, um, you know, a bit purposeful because, you know, some of those areas that this fund, these funds have just spread out to mm-hmm. probably make more sense where it's like a small business exactly. funds versus innovative funds because yeah. the founders, they are not thinking from You're a perspective right. of, I'm going to go raise venture capital. Right. Some of them will, mm-hmm. but the percentage, you know, if it's population based, well, let's look more at that population and see what percentage of that population might be starting mm-hmm. venture backable companies because it might be zero in some yeah. large, you know, populated areas because that's just not the culture there. Yeah. I, w- yeah. I wanted to add something to that too. That almost seems like it should drive a distinction between the two mm-hmm. because you have entrepreneurship and then you have innovation. Right. And it's like, Innovators are entrepreneurs, but not all entrepreneurs are necessarily innovators. And that's a perfectly right. fine thing. Mm-hmm. But when you di- when you make a distinction between the two, that should flow into how the hubs support those mm-hmm. those different types of entrepreneurs. Yeah. And I think right now it's still being clumped together a little bit or there's still right. a little bit of confusion there. And that also flows into 
how you're supporting those entrepreneurs because like we just said, there's different funding mechanisms, there's different mm -hmm. ways of advising how to build a business, there's different problems that are being dealt with in, in certain scenarios. Yeah. So well I, I know in into this like a couple like Hey, we were talking about, you know, part of our, our state I was in earlier today where, you know, the big entrepreneurs are uh, bread makers and candle makers and all these amazing businesses that, you know, with a little support and help, they could grow and scale for that type of product. They're not going to be the 300 person business. Um, the interesting thing about some of the changes for this for Amplify is the duality between an urban resource center and more of a rural resource center. So if you think about Louisville, we we look at it, we have a lot of resources in Louisville. A lot of they're clumped, they're very, you know, clumped together. We definitely have gaps, but we're blessed to be able to kind of air traffic control the founders to these different resources. Well, when you move to other parts of our state where it's more rural, where they they have mostly just an SBDC, right? Or their chamber. Um, and they're dealing with products and services that are different than what we're dealing with at Louisville, but we still have to service that, that community that just, we have to, we have to kind of wear two hats at that moment mm -hmm. yeah. and find out where the common thread is. And, you know, ultimately this is where a lot of our entrepreneur residence program idea comes in is maybe, you know, the idea for us moving forward is our entrepreneur residence that we want to have in the Lincoln trail area will not just be for tech enabled companies. So the, the the thing that we talk about internally is who do we got to support the ones that are doing the work now, but how do we unplug from the matrix, if you will, those people that could start tech businesses that are from Elizabethtown and um, just haven't had a group of people they can come out and talk to about it. That's yeah. been my interesting thing about traveling these last couple of weeks is there are more tech founders in these areas than I realize they just don't have the open coffees or they don't have the founder beers or whatever it is to come out and meet each other. And that's some of the things that we got to kind of agitate in these areas to create. So they see like, Hey, there's other crazy people out there too. Yeah. I think there's, yeah, there's definitely, and there's a lot of layers to it too. So you're describing like creating awareness for the community and, you know, putting resources between um, those people and organizations like yours to create that awareness mm -hmm. and create that community. But then there's resources for like tactical work yeah. and building the business. And yeah. it just seems like to me, you know, if I'm a founder in uh, Radcliffe, yeah, like if you really want resources and you want it bad enough, you should go to Louisville mm -hmm. to do that. And I'm not saying that um, everybody should do that, but if you're going to build a startup, like you've got to, you know, kind of go out of your way to do it because it's right. just so hard. Right. And so I think that's where I struggle with the strategy of the states is spreading it out doesn't make sense because if you're a great founder, you're going to have to leave Radcliffe right. at some point if you want to scale. I would imagine, you know, there's a few outliers in E-Town, yeah. for instance, there's plenty of outliers where, you know, we were talking, we're talking about, about before the yeah. podcast, you know, the Bowers and, but those are so much outliers that, you know, I think again. They're not outlier uh, for a state period. Yeah. Um, well, I think this is where kind of, we can't always rely on government to solve all of our problems. Yes. Right. Yeah. And I'll give Dave Knox tons of credit and something we're trying to work on in Louisville as well is like his Northern Kentucky Entrepreneurship Fund. That is an opportunity for the community to give back to startups, whether it's previous founders or other folks that want to lean into that model. Um, and I think that's the thing when I think of, and I even preach this when I go into Radcliffe um, or into E-Town now is like, you know, A, it takes a village, as we all know. Um, but what are the resources that we can leverage ex that exists as a flywheel effect? So we don't always, we're not always at the window of who's in the governor's mansion. I'll, I'll say that again. And I think to your point, it, you'll always have to go to where the biggest city is that has the most resources and usually the most capital. I don't think that changes no matter what state you're in, but it shouldn't have to be for like the very early stage basic stuff. Mm. And I think we owe our founders across the state at least that minimum viable access to resources um, no matter where, which is – you know, we've probably talked about this before, which is why Amplify focus quite a bit on a lot of our virtual community and our virtual resources. It's because we know we don't have the bandwidth or time, quite frankly, just to meet everyone. But how do we get 60% of those questions answered for those early, early stage companies before we have to take days off of work or we have to like figure out how to go to Louisville or Lexington where it might right. be? Yeah, I was going to, I'm glad you touched on the virtual piece because I was going to push back a bit and say, well, if you're in Radcliffe and you need educational resources, yeah, you could go to Louisville or you could go online, mm -hmm. you know, and learn, you know, I, I, again, I just, yeah, you know, I, I just 
struggle with the fact that we're, you know, spreading this out so thin, you know, I'd rather mm-hmm. see concentration, but that I get it. You know, there's so yeah. many dynamics there and politics are at play and, you know, that's the struggle <laughs> of politics and entrepreneurship. <laughs> right. Do not you get my, I always say when you get money from the state, which we're very lucky to do, it comes with strings. For sure. Right. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that we've been really successful at over the last several years is lifting up those partners. Again, because I know we can't do that work. We can't solve all the problems as Amplify, but how do we deputize or even just create awareness to those places in Radcliffe that already exist? Yeah. It's, and again, a lot of that we can do virtually through our through our site to say, hey, Evan, you can go see Sean over here to get mentorship around X, Y, Z. Yeah. And the, well, and just the funny thing, full <laughs> loop here to finish that. Yeah. That's right. why we created Miltech. Yeah. You know, it's because there was, you know, a need for scalable media to mm-hmm. reach the outliers and to reach, you know, even Lexington, I thought, didn't have a good enough yeah. virtual presence of if I'm an entrepreneur and I'm at UK, how do I learn about entrepreneurship of right. who is already doing it? There was nobody doing that. So I, I definitely think leaning in more to a virtual side yeah. of all I mean, you were doing the map before. I know when we first started looking at our map, you guys were down the road on building that out. Yeah. And so I think that's important is, you know, I was talking about this earlier. Like if you are really truly care about ecosystems, then there shouldn't be any thiefdoms. Like let's make all resources transparent and accessible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, if people are like, Oh, aren't you worried about losing a funder for this? I'm like, look, if Amplify is smaller in five years because everyone else is doing the good work. Great. We're yeah. winning. Right. And I think that especially generationally, it feels there's a lot more people, especially when these organizations are run by founders and like yours, you know, middle tech has been is like, you know what it takes and what it needs. And the ego kind of takes a backseat to that. Mm, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And that's also with middle tech, like it, it started off as just a labor of love, like without mm-hmm. even really having a plan to, yeah. to monetize it. And I think we still view it as that that same yeah. same way it's like if we for some reason don't have the state support doing it we're still going to do it because we it. still believe that it's, right. it's valuable to the, to the right. system and you know we've, we've danced around and talked around um a bunch of the different ways that you guys serve the startup ecosystem sure. but would love to hear your perspective on you know what are some of the amplifies initiatives that you're most proud of um, we've <sighs> talked about a bunch of different ones throughout yeah. here so you can pick out a few we've we've already touched on but um, yeah we'd love and, to and so kind of go back a little bit i know we started talking about the transition from leap to amplify and so there was that period of transition where, and again, this came with a new governor when Governor Bashir was elected and there were some changes at the Cabinet of Economic Development. They again looked at how they want to serve communities a little bit different, not such a drastic change as it was previously. And this gave us an opportunity as that net new entity that was called LEAP to apply for the RFP from the state and get that directly. Um, we did that. And then with my business partner, Jen Callahan, we just completely rebranded the organization to be Amplify because there had just been over that last year, just a lot of lingering concern, conflict, just negative baggage that came with what happens in communities. Um, and we wanted to start fresh, which was really leaning into celebrating and supporting founders by amplifying the work that they're doing. Um, and that fast forwards to how we do that now. So we talked about the stuff we do with the state, you know, I always joke my things that the three ways you can think about my day is 50% of the time I'm an air traffic controller, 25% of the time I'm a business coach, and then 25% of the time I'm a therapist. (laughs) Um, and while we focus mostly on tech enabled, because that's where our largest share of funding comes from, you know, we have some initiatives that we created. Some of this came out of civil unrest. Some of this just made sense, but our entrepreneur residence program has been really successful in our community. Because a lot of the work we do is 20 year plays, we said earlier, but the EIR program finds immediate returns for these founders. And the testimonials that come from, as you know, we've we've all probably helped these folks. You know, they start, I always talk about this one founder that was gonna build an application um, that was gonna be like Slack meets uh, Instagram. And he was gonna start with $7,500 from Kickstarter. And he was gonna use his CIS roommate to build the application. And I just remember going, there's nothing right about that. Um, and connecting him to one of our EIRs and, you know, fast forward 18 months later, had an app on both stores, Acceptitude, Accelerator in Austin. Um, and he gives us a lot of great feedback about how that was a big support for him. So the EIR program is probably our number one near-term ROI that we're proud of. But some of the other things which came from some of the Techstars work is, you um, you know, the last grant cycle, we spent 20% of our state grants supercharging other organizations. So I don't believe in duplicity. 
Um, and there's not enough of us to go around to duplicate the work that we're doing. So how do we supercharge those organizations, right? Think about the work that you all are doing. There'd be no reason to start a podcast. You guys do it better. And quite frankly, our money will go further by supporting the work that you are doing. Um, and so we've done a lot of that. So that's something else that we're really proud of that we've been doing. And then the last piece is when I took over, you know, it was really hard to be a part of the conversations in the community. And now we're blessed to have a lot of opportunities to partner. We get called now to join the conversations that are happening from an economic development standpoint in the community. And so just really proud of the fact that we have done the right work with the ego taking a backseat to then be able to be included in and want it to join a lot of the efforts. I love that. Well, you know, it, I know you've only been kind of at this for, for four years, but clearly making a lot of progress in, in taking the strides that it takes to, to build the innovation ecosystem, um, not only in Louisville, but in some of the surrounding counties that you guys are kind of taking over now too. In your opinion, um, what have been some of the biggest leaps in progress for, for the ecosystem that you've kind of, um, you know, been, yeah. been observing over the past couple of years? <laughs> well, it's interesting, right? If you think about Amplify's official date as Amplify is July of 2020. Right. So not, not, well, and, not, and think about 2020, we're in the middle of the pandemic. Right. We're not having events. Um, and so we're looking at the data for funding. You know, Evan, I know you and I have had this conversation, like there is, no funding, then a lot of funding, then no funding. And, you know, we've seen all these different things and we track, you know, um, through PitchBook and through other resources. I mean, we track a ton of the investment. So we've seen a good increase in investment over the years with the dollar, with the deal count being the being similar year over year, but the dollars being higher. So whether that is just inflation or whether that is we've got companies raising more dollars, um, that's been a kind of a leap. The other part, at least this is from my perspective, has just been more organizations that have been coming out of um, wherever they've been doing that work before and those silos are getting knocked down and there's more collaboration. It feels more collaborative and we often talk around, is this a generational difference? Is this something that we're doing that we don't realize we're doing um, as a community? And this isn't just Amplify, this is others um, have been really, you know, great to see because again, if we want to be successful long-term, it's going to take the collaborative village to make that happen. Um, the one thing that I would say that hasn't happened yet, maybe this was your next question, is we're still really, it's still really difficult to get the corporate community to understand the value of the innovation community. Mm. And I know that there are, and this is a, that was a broad brush. There are absolutely those that understand that. Um, but until they realize it's in their own best interest to make sure that the startups are successful, and that they're funded or they're getting connected or they're getting pilots, then I think it's going to be really hard for Louisville to break out of this stagnant slump of no really big exits from uh, a lot of the early state where companies that started early stage there. Yeah. How do you think about, and I think Louisville's going through, you know, as you said, there's ups and downs, there's mm -hmm. troughs and peaks. Sure. You know, Louisville seems to be in a point of struggle with the downtown area. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that feeds into, you know, the ecosystem from a startup perspective as yeah. well. How, how do you address that when maybe a founder is thinking about relocating to, to Louisville or you have a founder yeah. in Louisville and is struggling to build their team downtown? Like, how do you deal with that yeah. dynamic right now in a positive way? spend to that well it's interesting because you know i'm one of the few like our downtown while yes there has been the um the downtown commercial space is is becoming much more available and i know you know a lot about the real estate piece but it's more of there's still a lot of vibrant things going on downtown and as we think about and it's also this dichotomy of what downtown is between nulu and downtown Louisville. Yeah, yeah. You know, like what, what camp are you on? Is Nulu downtown or is Nulu not downtown? I mean, you have to kind of get that question answered first. And, you know, I think I remember 12, 14 years ago being on the advisory board of Enterprise Corps. We were really starting to talk about innovation districts and the importance of that. And how do we nudge our founders to locate an area to create density? You know, and now, you know, I think you guys, when you're there, like Market Street or between Quills and yeah. what was Story, like you run into people. We never had that before. Um, but from the downtown standpoint, I think it's an opportunity. Yeah. And I say this to the mayor's office that, you know, I, I've been point blank. I'm like, give me two floors of the Humana building for an entrepreneurship center. Right. Um, how do you make some of those spaces that we have instead of worrying about companies coming from other cities to occupy that? let the founders and the companies locally do that. 
at a price point that's affordable um, and get them downtown because they're going to bring young, usually young workers back downtown, which is, I think is what a lot of we want to see happening. Yeah. Nulu. Um, I, that's an important distinction there. Yeah. Whether or not that's included in downtown. Cause that's where so much of the action is. Yeah. And Render and Natalia and what they've done over at story yeah. and, um, you guys are there right next to yeah. Render, and that whole market is there is great. There's a bunch of great restaurants all in walking distance. And yeah. John Wilmoth put his camp down there on yeah. that street too. So that that seems to be where the area is. And I'm trying to figure out how the yeah. rest of downtown fits into it and how you you know craft that narrative. And I think you did it right. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah, I think it's you know the city the city forefathers, you will or whatever you want to call them, they have to figure out exactly what that plan is going to look like. Um, but my advice or my, when they, when they ask for it, <laughs> or even when they don't, um, is how do we, if you want to get startups in spaces downtown, make it really affordable. Mm. Like we want, I mean, yes, we'd like to be in new Lou because that's where the action is. But if you could put your team of six to 10 employees in a nice space downtown and then take the five minute walk to new Lou, you're going to do that. Yeah, for sure. Cause right now the, the challenge with new Lou is the saturation and the price per square foot. So as we look at startups now, as we would want to locate near where our office is, there's nothing that's affordable. I mean, I spend a lot of time finding people that want to sublease spaces inside of Nulu so we can put startups there. So there's a lot of appetite in my mind and demand for more space to be taken up that I think the downtown corridor, at least as you think about sprawling that way, could play a big role in that. I think that's a great way to think of all of that. I, and it, it just kind of points towards the the future that we're trying to build, not only in Louisville, but the, the state as a whole. And I've really enjoyed hitting on a lot of the things we talked about today, just around collaboration and yeah. um, in all forms, whether it's with corporates, whether it's yeah. with other organizations in the startup ecosystem. So, you know, Larry, thanks so much for, again, for making the drive. It's always yeah, fun. Yeah, man, this these, is great. For doing, doing yeah. these in person is always just so much better yeah. than, than doing them virtually. Um, and it was great to sit here and enjoy bourbon with you. So yeah, absolutely. Um, we're pumped for all the stuff you got going on with Thank Amplify. You. And if there's ever any ways that we can collaborate, we're always looking forward to to finding those. Um, before I let you go. Well, always, and real quick, I just want to say, yeah. I mean, thank you guys. I mean, you do this to your point earlier. I mean, you don't do this for the money. Right. You do it anyways. And I think it's important, the credibility that you two have and the voice that you carry to the startups around the state is is powerful. So thank you guys for doing this and providing an outlet for people like myself or founders across the community to kind of reach out otherwise. Cause there, I don't know of another podcast that was doing that before you two. So thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. That means a lot. Um, before we let you go, we always like to let guests kind of plug, um, where listeners can get more information about the organization. Sure. Um, so just tell them website, social channels, you personally, if they sure. connect with you. Um, website, um, amplify startups.com. Um, we also, for those that we have an AI powered chatbot called Eva. So you can ask her any question you want to about startups in the ecosystem. Um, socials, man, all this just changed recently. As we talked about, we dropped the Louisville from our name. So all of our social channels just changed. So I want to say they're at Amplify Startups, but don't quote me on that. And of course, for me, you can find me at LW Horn at almost all of the different channels. Awesome. Well, great interview. Thanks yeah, for thanks, coming man. in. Thank We're you guys. We're looking forward to the next one. Appreciate it, brother. <laughs>